one of my absolute favorite woodworking techniques is power carving. Now, when I first became interested in the technique, I had the good fortune of working with my good friend David Marks, and I wanted to know how you take square work pieces and turn them into sculpted, curved, beautiful, organic and flowing pieces of furniture. Uh, and the first thing he did was he brought out this uh, standard grinder. And I was actually a little bit surprised by it because it seems like a very rough tool. But he had it outfitted with an ArborTech blade. And what I realized is by using a very light touch, you can actually have a very light sculpting action or you could dig in and chips are gonna fly, which is an awesome experience if you've never done it before. All right, so that was when I first became uh, interested in the technique and the ArborTech blade is what allowed me to hog the bulk of the material away. So using this sort of uh, methodology, I really didn't want to make a piece of furniture. I only had a, a weekend that I was in uh, Santa Rosa at the time. So what we wound up doing was grabbing a piece of walnut burl and just making two circles. Now this is something that's been in the back of the, the show for a long time on the wall. I haven't put it in the new shop yet, uh, but basically Everyone wants to know what it is. Well, it's nothing. It's just a piece of wood. And basically we wanted to follow a circular template and then scoop out a very shallow dish or a shallow bowl, if you will, and have the two circles meet together with a peak in the middle. And that's really all this is. It's nothing special. It's just a practice in freeform carving to see if I could do it. Uh, so you can see it's even very rough on the back. Nothing, nothing much here. This is just a memory for me. And that's why I keep it in the back as a reminder of you know, where I got started. So this was the first thing I did. And then when I came home, I wanted to figure out how else I could apply this tool and the techniques to make pieces of furniture. So I moved on to something like this. This is a zebra wood sitting bench. It's made from three pieces of zebra wood, pretty straightforward and simple in terms of uh, general construction. But what you should notice about it is the amount of curves cut out of it. I've got a scoop here in the seat and I've got two little curves on the outside that are really just there for decoration. The legs themselves have a curve cut out in them and all of these curves are things that you could cut at the bandsaw but I really wanted to practice using my carving tools. So this was all carved with power tools as opposed to being cut with a bandsaw. There is one curve here that cannot be cut with the bandsaw and that's this inside curve here. All right, So the leg not only has a curve cut this way it also has a curve cut this way. So in that second dimension, you can't really do that at the bandsaw, at least not any bandsaw that I have access to. So that does have to be scooped out with carving tools. Uh, so even though I could have done a lot of this with another tool, it was a great exercise and really helped me hone my skills. So I made this thing about 10 years ago, and uh, for the longest time, it's just, yeah, it's cool looking, but it's not exactly the most practical seat. And then we found the perfect use for it in the past year right next to my son's crib. So it's kind of neat how you make stuff that uh, maybe has a special meaning because of, of where you built it or who helped you build it. And then you actually get to use it for something special in your life. So uh, there's, there's the mushy part of the show. Uh, but I wanted to show you some of the specifics with the ArborTech blades themselves. So let's take a close look. What I've got here are two of ArborTech's blades. This one is the industrial wood carver, and this is the one I've been using for years. You can see it's pretty well worn at this point, but I've got these three big teeth on here. That makes for an incredibly aggressive cut. I mean, look at those things, right? And they have a cutting edge on all sides. So regardless of how you address the material, you could really hog away a lot of stock in a short amount of time, but you do need to be careful because you could dig in too far and the tool wants to take a walk on you, which uh, could be very bad. Uh, but ultimately, it's a very aggressive stock removal tool and is very, very effective. Now, since then, it's been brought to my attention that ArborTech makes this turboplane. The turboplane is fundamentally different in that instead of those big round teeth, you've got these elongated blades here. And what this does is allows me to get a lighter cut and a more smooth of a cut because I can basically address the wood in different parts of this blade. So let's say I'm cutting right here where the blade protrudes the most, that's gonna be the most aggressive cut. Or if I back it off and flatten the tool out and maybe I'm touching the, the wood with this section of the blade where it doesn't protrude as much, it's gonna give me a finer cut. Additionally, one of the major uh, differences here is the fact that the blade does not protrude on the side, on the outer rim. Look at the old version. If you put anything on this outside rim here, it's gonna just chew it up and cut into it. That's not the case on a turboplane. So you can actually use this with a template, which is pretty incredible and it's a bit of a game changer. 
Now I haven't really used the turbo plane on an actual project. We had a giveaway a couple months ago and I used it in a skit, but I haven't made anything with it. So what I want to do today is use this tool for the first time. And uh, you got to cut me a little bit of slack because all of these carving tools have a bit of a learning curve. You have to use them and practice with them a few times to really get the feel for what they can do and how just a slight change in the angle and how you address the wood can make a significant change in the style of cut that you get from it. So that's actually what this is. I'm going to do a practice run making a chair seat. So let's get to it. And what I've got here is a seat blank. It's made from eight quarter alder, two boards basically glued together. I haven't really done anything special other than just gluing them together. Uh, alder is fairly inexpensive around here, so I don't mind using it for something like this for practice. And if you are gonna build anything like this, any type of uh, curved work or carved work, you really do want to have a couple of practice sessions before you do your actual work piece. And that'll give you a much better idea of what to expect. Now, normally what we would do is take a template like this, draw the line around the edge, reverse it, because it is symmetrical, so you use a half template to, to make it perfectly symmetrical draw the line on the other side, and then you would take the tool and try to work to your line. And that works just fine. But what I really want to experiment with is what happens when we use some double stick tape and we put the template in place and actually use the template itself to guide us around this edge to give us a nice clean, crisp edge. And that will then be the start of the work and we can work our way down and just keep removing stock. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. Let me remove the uh, double stick tape here and we'll get started. Now this double stick tape is pressure sensitive, so you gotta put downward pressure on there just to make sure you get a good bond. Now before we take the tool to the wood, we should talk about safety. This is a process that kicks up a lot of dust, a lot of chips, and they tend to go in sort of unpredictable directions. So something as simple as regular eye protection that we typically wear in the shop, I really don't feel that that's adequate. You don't really have enough protection. Now, if you have full goggles, that's a different story, but the ones I usually use do not protect me enough. So, fortunately, I have a lathe and I've already got a face shield for doing lathe projects. Something like this is actually perfect because it really guards your entire face. And you don't necessarily have to use these when you've got the guard in place. I also want to protect my lungs because that dust will be, there's going to be large chips, but there's also fine chips and fine dust that's going into the air. And I want to protect myself from that. And this thing is loud. Grinders make a lot of noise, so I will be protecting my ears. And this is a little hard to put all this stuff on at once. You could try it, uh, but you might just want to use earplugs because those are obviously a, a lot lower profile. You're going to look like a dork, but the bottom line is at least you'll still be able to see and breathe 30 years from now. It's important stuff. So, uh, well, let's, let's put on the gear and get started. Oh, yeah. In just that first couple of minutes, you could see what I've already managed to do. I'm following the template, it's creating a nice little dip, and I have a lot more material to remove here in the middle. And you can see the learning curve is something that just kind of happens within the first few minutes of using the tool. One thing I realized is that my template is a little bit short. This really should be made out of thicker material, uh, because then it gives you a nice reference edge. This way, with only this very thin stock here, um, it's a little bit difficult to get the blade to engage the right way. So what I wound up having to do was remove some of the stock so that the blade can come down just a little bit lower and then it makes contact with the template. That's something that you need to experience to really understand, but hopefully I could save you that trouble uh, and just recommend using it, I would say at least a half inch material for this uh, template stock. Uh, but even with this, I was able to work back to my template and create the initial shape of the chair. Now with this design, really as far as that edge is concerned, you don't really want it to dip down in the vertical dimension too much. So that's probably about as far as I really even want to go with this. And I can remove the template and do the same thing on the other side and then just work in the sections in the middle. All right, so we'll do exactly that.
All right, so I've got the other side established now and I'm gonna remove the template and really all I need to do is work on the interior sections and blend them in to the edges that I've created already. But I do wanna show you one mistake that I made because I think mistakes are always a good learning opportunity and I don't pretend that I don't make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Some of us just choose not to show them. Look right here, I actually dug into the template on the back on that first run. Now the reason this happened is twofold. Number one, as I was bringing the tool around, I wasn't really paying attention to the turn. So I was just keeping the tool in this orientation and running the blade along the edge. So it really didn't take too much for that blade to just make contact with the side. What really needed to happen was the tool needed to rotate with the curve. And I didn't do that, so that's one of the reasons. The second reason is again because this template just isn't thick enough. If this was a little bit higher, it'd be much harder for that blade to get up and over the template and it would be a lot easier to follow the guide. So I really did make my life a little bit more difficult here by using such a thin template. But this is why we practice. We need to get to know the tool, we need to get to know the technique, and we have to make mistakes to understand where the limitations and the little nuances are so we can navigate around them in the future. All right, so this is something that, well, if this was an actual uh, chair, you might have to move the back, uh, you know, toward the back of the chair a little bit and actually change the shape, which would really, really wouldn't be that big of a deal to have to do that. I'm not really worried about it. I'm not going to fix it. I'm just going to kind of continue working with the middle section here. But I think it's important to talk about flaws and things like that because they are definitely good to learn from. And for the rest of this, I'm just going to have fun with it. I'm really just trying to remove the bulk of the stock, try to keep a little bit of a peak in the middle, and just see what I can do with it. I want to get to know the tool, and I'm not so worried about making mistakes. I'm not worried about ruining this workpiece. That's why we practice, right? So let's just go at it. I'm going to try and get as much footage as I can so you can see exactly what I'm doing. Uh, but there's really not a whole lot to say about it. I'm just kind of taking the tool to the wood and seeing what it can do. And hopefully when it's all said and done, we'll have something that looks somewhat like a chair seat. Now at this point, I think we're pretty much done. We probably could go a little bit deeper in the seat. If I were really making a full on chair seat, I'd probably sit in this and see how it feels. Uh, and then you could just determine if you need to go a little bit deeper. I would also take measures to make sure that the depth is consistent in both sides. You know, So you could actually get a straight edge or a dowel in a piece of wood and just push the dowel down and just compare how far down the depth is. And if you need to work it a little bit more, you can. Now, one thing I learned in the learning curve with this whole thing, uh, you can really do gentle cuts and you could do aggressive cuts, but you need to understand and get to know the blade and how it works. So over time, I may develop skills that are good enough to really smooth this out, to, to decrease the amount of work I have to do after I'm done with it. So I might be able to get a pretty darn smooth surface. But for now, I've got a little bit of a scalloped surface here that will definitely need more work. But again, I think with more time and practice, I probably could get better results from this guy as I learn to run it in a way that produces a more smooth and even cut. But ultimately, the real job of this tool is to hog the bulk away, and then we have lots of other ways to smooth it. Uh, for instance, I would go from here and start using one of my rasps. A great thing about a rasp is that it knocks down the high points, and you could really start to finesse these curves, you could finesse the pummel, knock down the sharp point a little bit just to make it super comfortable. Uh, I may also come in here with a small sander and just try to even and smooth everything out from there. But the, um, well, the turbo plane just did a fantastic job of moving through this. And frankly, the results with this, uh, I think are an improvement for someone who's doing a little bit more finesse work uh, than the industrial version. Uh, this one, I actually wind up with a more rough surface and I'm a little bit more cautious with it because I think it can do a lot more damage in a short amount of time. So turboplane for something like this is definitely gonna be my go-to tool from now on. 
Now I've said this numerous times in the past, but one of my bucket list woodworking projects is a Maloof inspired rocker or even a Maloof inspired uh, low profile chair. And both of those require a carved seat and a lot of other carved parts as well. So having a nice array of tools that remove wood in sort of a freeform fashion is a really good idea if you're gonna embark on that type of build. So I'm really glad I was able to do this and show this tool because it gave me a lot of practice with it and now I'm that much more familiar and more confident to go into something like a Maloof rocker build. But if you really extend beyond that and think of all the projects that you do and all the ways you might be able to to really make curves in ways that you would never really be able to make it with any other tool. And something like the turbo plane is a really good way to do that. So if you get a chance, check it out, get some practice with it, prepare to make a whole lot of dust. I got wood chips all over the shop, but if you protect yourself, it's fine, just vacuum them up later. But ultimately, I gotta say I'm pretty happy with this. Maybe I should hang this on the wall behind me instead of the other, um, the other one. And everyone will know what it's, <laughs> what it's from and why I did it. Uh, but ultimately, I think I might, I might do a little bit more work on this just to see where it goes, but this does give me the confidence that it shouldn't be too difficult to do this in the context of an actual Maloof-inspired chair. All right, so thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.